shy. Yeah, you're shy. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, you're known occasionally to share a thought or two on how the industry is doing. Uh, you recently uh, posted a few thoughts on OpenAI, uh, compared them to some other illustrious tech companies. I think uh, WeWork and Theranos were in there. I, I did not mention Theranos in connection to OpenAI in this calendar. No, that's probably not true. I, I didn't in the recent essay in, in any case. <laughs> WeWork I did, uh, did connect them to. I mean, the, the, the valuation, $500 billion for a company that has never made a profit and is now threatened by Google Gemini and many others. There's no moat there. There's no technical moat. Like, it doesn't really make sense to me. And so I think it is possible that their valuation could drop precipitously. They could get absorbed by Microsoft. I mean, there are a lot of different scenarios. But, you know, I think everybody saw the Brad Gerstner moment when, when Gerstner kind of lobbed him a softball and said, just explain what the strategy is here. You know, you make $13 billion or whatever it is in revenue. You have $1.4 trillion in That doesn't work out? I typed How in ChatGPT that said that's good math. It's, yeah, it's, it's ChatGPT math. <laughs> so, but I want to I wanna challenge you. It's, it's fun and we should have some, some fun and, and, and so forth. But I'm also curious, because you've been pretty consistent about your views on sort of LLMs and their value. And as you're, do you use them on a regular basis? Do you test it out? Because I find it's pretty darn useful. You can believe that it's not the path to AGI and it's not broadly, broadly applicable for every task and still get a whole lot of use out of these. Do you not well, have that two, experience? There's two things there. One is I think they are genuinely useful, not for me. So they are genuinely useful, for example, for coding. There's no question about that. I have said that right along. There's no question that they're useful for brainstorming. I've said that right along. If the cost of error is low, if you have a human in the loop that can check it and so forth, there are a bunch of applications. My own interest is in AGI. And so new model comes out and I try it out and it still has the same problems that I've been writing about for a quarter century. Hallucinations, reasoning problems, and, and so forth. And at that level, I never really see any change. And then the other thing is like, what do I do? So I don't code anymore. I have a bunch of times in my life, but I don't happen to be doing any coding right now. Most of what I'm doing is writing and I like the writing. And so like, for me, I don't want it to write for me. And I don't like, I don't like the writing that it does. I don't trust its facts, et cetera. So for me, it doesn't have any particular value except, um, you know, I like to experiment occasionally to see, can it solve these problems yet? Have you tried recently, you're finished writing, you're done, you're really happy with it and saying, what are some possible criticisms to this? What might someone who disagrees say? I haven't done that. I think I know pretty well what my critics say usually, but um, I mean, maybe that'd be an interesting exercise. Um, so I've been asking everyone about, are we in a bubble? I have some guesses where you might go. Oh, sorry, sorry, let me, before we get to the bubble, somebody did just send a critique of ChatGPT of Gary Marcus, and it was wrong on most of its details. The, the weirdest thing was- But you say your human critics are wrong on most of their Many details. of them are. Um, I mean, that is true. In particular, most of the things that it said that I said, I didn't actually say, which I guess is kind of typical of, of the hallucination of the system. It is also true that many of my human critics like to misrepresent me. So, um, so it's reached parity with humans. So in that way, it has reached parity with some humans, yeah. Um, so on that. the bubble question, my guess is you might vary slightly from uh, Aaron Levy's take on things. What? What elements of a bubble do you see? Is it the, you know, tens of billion dollars in revenue and a trillion dollars in spending? Does that kind of worry yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, I've been writing about this for a couple of years, in fact. Um, I think LLMs will continue to exist for a while. I think the fundamental problem is that they're heading towards a commodity. So I started to think about this stuff in 2023. I wrote an essay in August 23, and I was thinking about what is the consequence of a likely diminishing phase, a likely phase of diminishing returns, um, where everybody is building the same kinds of systems, and so nobody has a technical moat. It's like, what is the consequence of that? And I realized that that meant that LLMs were gonna become a commodity, 
I also realized that given the nature of the architecture itself and how they do things, which we could talk about, that they're unlikely to solve problems of hallucinations. I figured we were not going to get to some chat GPT-5 that was going to be AGI the way a lot of people were talking about it a couple years ago. And so I said, what are the natural consequences? Well, if it's a commodity, you're just not going to make that much revenue. And also, you're scaling it, so it's going to be more and more expensive. And so you're going to reach this point where it's just not going to make good financial sense. And, and that's, I think, what the world is now kind of looking at, is you know, the return on investment has not been that high. The costs are very high. Nobody except NVIDIA is making all that much money. Maybe one or two companies, who knows, making money. But you know, the big players are, are losing money. And the commodity problem and this kind of like pileup of similar models, they're all better than four, but none of them are what we imagined for uh, GPT-5, is such that like, you know, now Gemini sort of slides in there. It's not, you know, radically better than the other one, but it, you know, Google could afford to give it away cheaper. You can ask our next guest um, if, if he has any comments on that. But, you know, if they want to annihilate open AI, they probably can. And but there does do seem a, to be a little bit of a dichotomy here. On the one hand, the technology isn't very good at anything from your perspective. At the same it's good at some things, as I said a second ago, right? It is good at some things, but the, are the economics there? So the, the, let me try a, a, a slightly different formulation, which is I think that AGI will be worth trillions of dollars, right? If you could replace the entire knowledge economy of the United States, alone, that's probably a trillion dollars or more, right? So I think AGI would be worth a lot of money. But the rate limiting step with LLMs is the accuracy, the reliability that I keep harping on. And that means for many tasks that you just can't count on them. And you certainly can't just like stick it into your process the way that people were imagining a couple years ago and say, hey, just go, go work with my data. The reality is to make it work in any system, you wind up building a lot of classical engineering around your task. Um, and maybe it can't do your task at all, and so forth. And so like when people get in the weeds, after having built a prototype that seems amazing, they discover it's really hard to make it reliable enough. I think a lot of people have discovered that. So yes, you can find some stuff to do. You can do some customer service stuff and so forth, but you can't do the whole knowledge economy. There are too many jobs where there's a high cost of error or where you have to generalize beyond the data that you've seen before, et cetera, where these systems are actually kind of weak. And so that limits their scope. If they were as cheap to operate as classical software, they'd still be worth a lot, right? I mean, coding's probably worth, what, $20 billion a year, $40 billion a year? If you could really replace all coders, it would be even more. But coding assistants are maybe worth 10 or $20 billion a year. But that's just not enough revenue to justify you know, trillions of dollars in expenditure. So the math doesn't work. So we've talked about some of your critiques. There's a few more I want to get to, but one of the things I'm curious is, we hear all the time what you don't like about AI as we have it today. But this is your field. You, you're studying AI. I you're talking love about, AI. I want it to work. So, so that's what I want to do. What would a good deployment of AI look like for you? What should we be doing? What is promising? How do we get there? Where should we be spending our time and energy? So there's a few different things. So one is we should stop trying to build these general purpose chatbots. They just don't work that well for many tasks. There, there's some value in them, but <coughs> we should probably focus more on domain-specific solutions. My favorite one is from your next guest, Alpha, AlphaFold, right? AlphaFold does one thing and only one thing, but it does it really well. It doesn't do it perfectly. There's some limits on it, but you know, it takes in a string of nucleotides. It spits out a three-dimensional structure. It has built-in constraints to allow it to do that. It's a mixture of innateness and learning, and it works great. And we should do more of that. Now, there are reasons why that solution is not general purpose. You can't do the, what they did there everywhere. But I think trying to work on scientific problems with focus, trying to um, have pre-built knowledge where you need it, instead of being doctrinaire, trying to learn everything from data, but still doing some learning, I think that's useful. So that's one kind of answer. Another kind of answer is we need to build neurosymbolic AI, and I can walk you through what that means, and world models. I wrote a piece in, in 2020 called The Next Decade in Archive, and um, Next Decade in AI, which is in Archive, and pointing to four things. And the world models and neurosymbolic AI were kind of at the top of the list. So neurosymbolic AI is integrating <coughs> Kind that's, of, to explain it real quick, that's AI that kind of works the way a human brain works. I mean, yes and no. Okay. So, so, so the, the way in which it's kind of like yes is some people here probably know Kahneman's System One and System Two distinction in his bestseller Thinking Fast and Slow. <clears throat> so 
symbolic AI, sorry, uh, neural networks are kind of like Kahneman system one, which is fast, automatic, reflexive, yeah. and so forth. And most of what we have right now, not all, but most of the AI we have right now works that way. System two is supposed to be deliberative. Uh, it's more maybe driven by facts, by reasoning relative to those facts, um, drawing true conclusions if the premises are true, and so forth. Um, that's like symbolic AI. That's what classical AI did. They actually have different strengths and weaknesses. And there's a sociology where the people who have worked on the two kind of hate each other. You know, they fought over resources and grad students and money. Um, yeah, I was just interviewing Dakai around the block on, uh, on at the library stuff. who has a book on this. So, so we need to bring them together, right? Neural networks are really good at learning, but they're not good at abstract reasoning. And you, know, you periodically see these absolutely bizarre things. The symbolic stuff is good at abstract re reasoning, but not nearly as good at learning. We need some kind of bringing together of them. So that's one thing, but <coughs> that's only necessary. It's not sufficient. Um, one way to think about it is like telling people that you can build a computer program and here's how a program works, here's what an if statement is, and here's what a function is, and so forth, only gets you so far. You ultimately need to build operating systems and you need to have patterns of design like model view controller and, and so forth. So it gets you into the game to know what a coding system is, but then you have to build you know, appropriate code and there can be lots of layers. So neurosymbolic AI, which I would say is still nascent, um, gets you into a new game in which you can integrate pattern recognition that neural networks do well with symbolic representation. And there are some good examples of it. I believe that AlphaFold is one, and certainly systems like, but not all the details are public, um, certainly systems like um, Alpha Geometry and Alpha Proof are explicitly neurosymbolic, and they do some pretty interesting things. Um, so you know, there's been some progress, but we don't know, have enough practice in it. The other thing that we really need is world models. So and that has become a big area of investment. And that has become a big area of interest. Um, and it should. You know, the argument I made back to 2019 is that LLMs don't have world models. And people looked at me like it was an alien. But, but the reality is they don't. They, do not, they don't systematically parse the world into particular entities and things. So like right now, people can look it up, look at us on the stage, and they can say, well, they're sitting in chairs, and there's a projected background, and they can think of us as people. So you know, we have psychology where you know, you're nodding your head, so you're probably following me, or maybe you'll interrupt me if you don't. And so the audience is building a model of us and the things that we're talking about. And LLMs are bad at building new models of things. My favorite example of this is chess, right? An LLM gets trained on millions of games of chess because they're in the database. They read everything that's in the internet. Um, so they have millions of examples of games of chess. They have millions of copies of the rules of chess, like chess.com and Wikipedia. They have books about chess, like Bobby Fischer Teaches Chess, which is the, the book that I learned chess from. They have all of this, and they, will, they can even answer a question like, can a queen jump over a knight? They'll get it correct, but then they will play, and they will sometimes make illegal moves if, if you're um, far from the typical position, like having a queen jump over a knight. So they don't build a mental model, um, to use terms from psychology, um, or a world model, cognitive model, of how chess actually operates what the board is, what the pieces can do. This is a serious failing, and it limits everything. All the hallucinations we see are because they're not proper world models. I wrote a whole essay um, about my friend Harry Shearer, whose voice everybody knows because he does Mr. Burns and the Simpsons. So he's a well-known person, so his Wikipedia you know, will tell you where was he born, Los Angeles, right? Um, and yet somebody sent him biography, which he passed along to me, written by GPT, that said that Harry Shearer was a British actor, right? The data are immediately available. He, because he's a reasonably well-known actor, you, know, you can find it in an IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes, and you know, it's not hard to find where it's actually born. If you had a proper world model, in that case, just stuff that's in the boxes in Wikipedia, which should be trivial to enter into your world model, then you could make an inference over it, and you could say, you know, there's so much data for the conclusion that he's born in Los Angeles, and no actual data for the notion that he's British. This must be wrong. But an LLM can't do that. It doesn't actually fact check, it doesn't actually work with reference to something like a database, or really you need many databases. And there are different kinds of colluges, if you know that word, like clumsy solution, um, with duct tape and rubber band, where people use techniques like RAG and so forth, but none of them work that well. This is still a core problem with LMs, is they do not have a proper world model. And so yes, some people are finally recognizing that. I'm not sure they're fully recognizing it. There, there's a notion of a world model which is basically just like predicting what happens next in a, in a video, which I think is not a strong enough notion of world model. And we'll 
and see a bunch of work about that in the next few years. And what else do you think is missing from the conversation? We only have about a minute left. Where should we be putting more of our time and energy? I think the things that I just mentioned, and also I'll just put in a pitch for ethics. I think that we need to think about how we are going to build an ethical AI where artists and writers are compensated, where you can't just make deep fake, um, you know, non-consensual deep fake porn of teenagers and so forth. And the other problem with LLMs is you can't really align them. You just put in stuff like <coughs> um, don't hallucinate, and they hallucinate anyway. If you say don't do harm to humans, they do anyway, um, or at least potentially do anyway. And so we need a much stronger solution to the alignment problem. M my last thing I'll say is I think LLMs are like a dress rehearsal, right? They're not AGI. Anybody who thinks they are is just not really following the technical detail well enough, I think. But they give us a chance to think about what would the world be like if we had AGI. And one of the things that I think we've failed on is to figure out how to meaningfully regulate them such that they are safe. And that's really something we should think about. It's a good point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gary Marcus.